republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thanks for that. And the last time, uh, our last meeting, we had some uh, interruption going on that we had to uh, close the meeting early. And because of that, I didn't get to uh, read my read well, my two uh, quotes to end the, to end the meeting at the end. So I'm going to start out with a couple of my quotes that I had last time to bring a little levity, hopefully, to the uh, to the audience. Uh, the first one is from Mickey Mantle. It says, "He who has the fastest golf cart never has a bad lie." And I'm sure anybody who plays golf gets that one. The second one is from Hank Aaron. It said. It took me 17 years to get 3,000 hits in baseball. I did it one afternoon on the golf course. <laughs> so anyways, uh, our next is the swearing-in ceremony. And I, and I want to say uh, we have lots and lots of great people in Orono. It was amazing how many people we had apply. Uh, after all the different interviews, uh, we had one person who stood out, uh, kind of hesitant, hesitant I guess that was a heads and tails, but heads above the rest. Uh, Maria, to my right, she grew up in Orono. Her kids are going to Orono. Uh, she's a very accomplished business person, building up a restaurant, a number of restaurants from scratch, uh, which also brought her lots of experience with city councils and planning commissions with all the uh, things you have to get variance to do those type of things. Um, so it is my pleasure to swear in our newest council member, Maria Beach. So Maria, let me, uh, let's go down here at the podium. Do you have a thing to, to read? Yeah. Oh, that's already up there. Okay. Right. Okay, raise your right hand. Hi, say your name. Hi, Maria Beach. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support. That I will support. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And the Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties. Of the Office of City Council Member. Of the Office of City Council Member. Of the City of Orono. Of the City of Orono. In the County of Hennepin. In the County of Hennepin. In the State of Minnesota. In the State of Minnesota. To the best of my judgment and ability. Uh, to the best of my judgment and ability. All right, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Consent agenda tonight is number two, City Council meeting minutes of June 12th. We had number three, City Council work session minutes of June 12th. We have four claims and bills. Excuse me. We have number uh, and number five. We will take off and do right after uh, this real quick. Um, so I have a motion. Uh, does anybody want to take any of those items two, three, or four off? I see no objections. I have a motion of one off. Uh, do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Note that passes 5 0. And Councilmember Vincent had a question on number 5. Sure. Okay, I'd like to hear more about this because I understand that the intention here is to um, do away with the work sessions. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you came to that decision and what the purpose is. Yeah. Okay. Mayor, 
Council. Um, really what we're looking at is, uh, so we have 11 meetings throughout the year, four regular meetings and seven work sessions. Uh, over the last two years, I've seen that our work sessions, we've struggled to fill them with content uh, and on a regular or a consistent basis. So what we're looking at is canceling the remainder of the work sessions for the year. Uh, and, and, and for following years as well, and then scheduling them as needed uh, throughout the year. So this year we don't have too many projects that we need to discuss. If something comes up, then we would schedule a work session where the Park Commission can meet. Uh, and there, really that's about it. Uh, Park Commission has worked really hard, they've done a great job. They've gotten to a lot of these work sessions and they've tried to discuss certain things and it, it's been uh, somewhat contentious at times. So we're just trying to scale back some of these meetings if we don't have so you feel like you'll just address those issues in the regular meetings then? Whatever would have been discussed in work sessions, you can Yeah, so roll it what in. we're looking at is our, we have subcommittees and then we have park assignments for each commissioner. Uh, and we'll have more <laughs> emphasis on uh, staff interaction with the council member, or sorry, uh, commissioner uh, for those, those tasks. And then uh, we will bring those to the regular meetings and then eventually to Do I make a motion to present one back? Sure. Make a motion to approve um, number five, um, 2023 official meetings calendar update. Okay, motion to a second. I'll second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, no, that passes 5 0. Okay, we are fortunate to have our uh, Hennepin County Commissioner uh, Crystal Chandras today. We've got an annual update, and he wore a special Hawaiian shirt for us. If we got the memo, we would have worn ours too. So. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for your close. You're very close. Yeah, very, very close on Council Member Beach. Uh, that's a little bit of an inside joke. I give these uh, uh, annual updates for the benefit of your audience. Uh, first time I came in here wearing a full suit, and uh, all of you were wearing uh, wine shirts. I felt a little overdressed. So <laughs> made it a point uh, to wear a wine shirt at these meetings. Um, anyways, uh, good evening, <laughs> Mayor Walsh Council. Uh, as my esteemed colleagues in local government, uh, thank you for uh, welcoming me here to my annual County update. I believe we sent along a uh, presentation. Something should have teed up here, but I'll uh, get started while we uh, while we tee that up. Uh, my name is Chris Latondres. I'm your Hennepin County Commissioner representing District uh, Six, which includes my hometown of Hopkins, uh, Minnetonka, Edina, Eden Prairie, and 12 cities around Lake Minnetonka, including uh, the city of Warren. Uh, you might, you might go on the next slide here. Uh, when I tell folks I'm uh, their Hennepin County Commissioner, the most common question I get is, uh, what the heck is a commissioner? And uh, I, uh, I get it, Hennepin County often flies under the radar screen. But we are actually Minnesota's second largest uh, government uh, by budget, second only to the state, and the largest local unit of government, which of course includes our cities, our, uh, our school districts, and Minnesota's 87 counties. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our board, uh, there are seven of us commissioners, functions much like this council. Together we steward a $2.7 billion annual budget across a broad range of topics, human services, public health, public safety, uh, public works, uh, resident services, that includes our libraries and our elections. Uh, through our HRA, we also steward considerable investments in housing and economic development, and we do this on behalf of the 1.26 million residents who call Hennepin County home. Uh, one in five Minnesotans. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it's a big responsibility, and if there's uh, one thing that I've learned uh, serving our shared residents, it's that the only way any of this is possible is through uh, strong partnerships. So, Mayor Walsh, Council, I promise to do my part to ensure that the partnership between Hennepin County and the City of Warnow remains strong uh, for years to come. Um, and so tonight my goal is to offer a brief uh, snapshot of what your county government has been up to since we last connected, uh, I think around a year ago, on a few key topics, uh, housing, public safety, mental health, and our economic recovery. And I'll make myself available at the end for any of your questions. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll jump in on housing stability. Uh, first slide, please. Um, we now face an intersecting crisis of affordable housing and homelessness that has only surged with the sunset of the federal eviction moratorium this past summer and the, uh, the end of emergency rental assistance uh, dollars that Hennepin County uh, administered on behalf of the federal government. Uh, one in three uh, Hennepin County families are housing costs burdened, that's the information on this slide, uh, which means they pay more than a third of their uh, 
income on their rent or their mortgage. Uh, we have now seen, as we've emerged uh, from uh, on the other side of these uh, eviction moratorium and these dollars, a doubling of family homelessness over pre-pandemic levels. Our family shelters are operating at 230% capacity, which is, uh, uh, we've never seen it before in Hennepin County's history, and we're having to rebase like some of our uh, assumptions around what that looks like. Um, and that definition of family homelessness is a parent and a child with no place to uh, to sleep at night. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we don't have to look very far to understand why. Uh, there are 73,000 extremely low-income households in our county and fewer than 15,000 uh, units available to them. A startling gap of nearly 50,000 units that directly connects to this surge in homelessness we're seeing. Uh, next slide. That's why for our part, uh, Hennepin County stewards uh, over $106 million annually across a full continuum of resident housing needs from homeless shelters to affordable home ownership and everything in between. Uh, next slide. Uh, and with the American Rescue Plan, uh, those dollars we received, we've also gone big on housing stability. Uh, $96 million of our uh, $246 million we've invested on housing. Uh, it's garnered some national attention, including from uh, U.S. Housing and Urban Sector. Uh, Urban Development Secretary Marsha Fudge, who in a recent uh, meeting uh, with uh, me and a couple of my commissioner colleagues in Washington, D.C., not only praised the scale of Hennepin's uh, investments, but also some of our innovations, uh, converting hotels into single room occupancies, and Vivo Village, which is the uh, first indoor tiny home village anywhere in the country that directly facilitates some of those uh, exits from homelessness. Uh, there's a lot more work uh, that we need to do, uh, but you can be proud to live in a county that's really looked to as a national leader on housing. Uh, next slide. Uh, just uh, quickly before we move on, I just wanted to spotlight a few of the ways uh, these dollars are going to use right here at District 6. I don't believe there's any uh, projects in this cycle or no, uh, but our office is here to field questions and make connections with any uh, developers you may know who operate in this space or interested in learning more about these grant opportunities. Uh, next slide. Our next topic tonight is public safety. Uh, I'm the vice chair of Hennepin's, uh, Hennepin County's uh, Public Safety Committee, our Law Safety and Justice Committee, and it remains a top priority of mine. Uh, I'm in frequent conversation uh, with our chiefs, uh, fellow uh, Chief Barniak, nice to see you, uh, our new sheriff, uh, Delana Witt, and I continue to listen and learn from our officers and first responders uh, on the front lines through regular, regular riding ones. In fact, in just October, I was with uh, is it Sergeant Hennessy. Yeah, absolutely. Nice time together in, in October. Uh, with a workforce uh, shortage that is uh, affecting all of our departments and increased uh, pressure pressures to serve residents with me mental and behavioral health challenges, uh, it's critical that we get these public servants the resources and support that they need to do their jobs with fidelity and excellence. Uh, that's why, for our part, uh, we approved the Sheriff Office new request for 31 uh, new FTEs, uh, new deputies. Uh, we're still uh, looking to fill those. Uh, subject to a lot of those same workforce pressures. Uh, it's also why we approved 8.2 million. Uh, Hennepin is sort of the lead uh, partner on expanding the North Metro Public Safety uh, Training Facility in Maple Grove, uh, which recently officially opened for business. I think we're doing the ribbon cutting uh, yet this summer, but that's now open and operational. Uh, next slide. Uh, it's also why we moved with urgency to expand uh, what I believe is one of the most promising public safety uh, partnerships and initiatives anywhere in our nation our embedded social worker partnership with local law enforcement. It only happens as a partnership uh, between Hennepin County and our uh, local departments, uh, including uh, the city of Orono. Uh, what started as a pilot in 2019 with five social workers in six departments has now expanded uh, this year to 45 workers covering every city and department in Hennepin County, uh, including the Orono Police Department. Uh, it's a, a model, and we've got data to back this up, that better meets the needs of our residents in crisis, uh, it frees up our police to do critical police work, uh, and it makes all of us uh, more safe. And I believe that's a perfect model of good government in action. Uh, next slide. Uh, while we're on this sort of adjacent uh, topic of rising behavioral uh, mental health uh, needs, uh, Hennepin County uh, also is a really important system, part, uh, system partner in addressing uh, mental and behavioral health needs of residents more broadly. Uh, we uh, facilitate a wide array of services in this domain uh, to help uh, both uh, amplify and promote these uh, services, but also to help reduce uh, stigma for residents that might be experience, uh, experiencing a mental health issue. We've recently 
uh, launched this uh, C Mental Health uh, campaign. You may have seen it on billboards, you may have seen it on your mobile phone. Um, if you click on that link, uh, it uh, helps residents uh, know what services uh, and opportunities they have. The interface, I believe we've had over 70 million impressions since we launched this campaign this past year. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm also proud to report we're making uh, great strides in specifically addressing the mental health needs of our students. Uh, according to the CDC, more than four in 10 students feel persistently sad or hopeless, and one in three experience poor mental health. Uh, it's a painful trend that's only gotten worse. Uh, by some measures, it's tripled uh, since uh, the, uh, the end of pan the pandemic. Uh, through Hennepin County's school-based mental health partnerships, uh, we're now providing services to over 6,000 students annually, and then as of this year, 2023, um, I'm uh, excited to report that we've expanded these uh, services and this partnership to every single school district, every single eligible school, countywide. It's a key uh, county priority that I've uh, championed and our board has supported. I just uh, observed that in the midst of this uh, crisis of loneliness and social uh, disconnection, uh, in fact, uh, the Surgeon General uh, recently released a report, a report on, the, on uh, social disconnection and loneliness as a public health crisis. It's possible to quantify that. Uh, our students and our young people uh, need to know that somebody cares about them. And so I'm grateful for the partnerships, uh, in this case with our schools, uh, that make those investments possible. Uh, third, uh, fourth and final spotlight, uh, next slide please. A uh, full economic recovery means supporting our small businesses, uh, which are the backbone of our community. Uh, during the pandemic, Hennepin County uh, directly uh, invested over 70 million of our uh, pandemic assistance dollars in grants to small businesses, including over 9.5 million of those, uh, those 70 million right here in District 6, and I believe about a quarter million uh, in, in Oregon, uh, quite a bit around uh, the lake. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but we know our responsibility doesn't end uh, here. Uh, that's why we've launched Elevate Hennepin. It's a resource hub connecting local entrepreneurs to expert advisors at uh, no cost on a wide range of topics that you can see up here on this, uh, this slide. And folks can uh, go to elevatehennepin.org uh, to learn more about uh, that array of programming. Next slide. Uh, it's just one piece of a broader strategy that uh, Hennepin County is growing to support entrepreneurs and businesses at every stage of their uh, development, including through a range of additional programs that you can see uh, offered here. And today, over 2,300 uh, businesses have engaged uh, in a variety of uh, services you see underneath this uh, Elevate Hennepin, Hennepin umbrella, um, accessing over 9,500 hours of free one-on-one uh, -on -one advising. Uh, we also have uh, CEO cohort groups for businesses over a certain size. Uh, so whether you've got a new idea that you're looking to establish a business around or you're a larger business that might even be trying to learn from peers on how you facilitate an exit, um, we're here to, uh, to help at every stage. Uh, next slide. Finally here, uh, just before turning things back over to you, uh, Mayor Welch, Walsh, uh, for your reference, our public works team uh, wanted me to include a list of current and uh, future projects uh, here around the lake, and I, I won't go through all of these uh, tonight, and I'll just uh, say I'm also not an expert on these, but if you want uh, some additional information on any of those, uh, we're happy to facilitate those connections, and I just want to extend my uh, gratitude to the partnerships uh, with your public works team that uh, makes uh, these investments uh, move forward. So with that, Mayor Walsh, Walsh we, have a, we have a lot of county roads here, so we appreciate you keeping them up to the Orono standard that we keep our own roads up to, so I appreciate that. But, but obviously, especially the expensive ones like the bridges and that kind of stuff. Obviously, another important one that's, that you guys do a great job with is uh, helping continuing funding with the uh, Hennepin County Water Patrol, uh, which is a big deal for us. Um, and I know we've got the uh, Richie Anderson, who's our OMCD <coughs> rep, uh, with a few other people have raised some money to be able to get two dedicated uh, Hennepin County sheriffs out here too, which is a big deal. So when they get called off, people don't realize that there's only so many water patrol and if there's an emergency at some other lakes, they all can be called out and there's nobody here. That's and right. so we have raised our, uh, community has raised their own money to have two dedicated people here, which is a big deal, but just having them in general is, is awesome. So I think we've worked, uh, we've, we've had a good partnership working all these things through and we're kind of looking forward to more of those in the future. And we've done a lot of Hennepin County grants as well. And so I know we've had a lot of interaction with Adam and our, our city administrator on that as well. So we appreciate all the help and working doing everything in our community, so. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Walsh, and uh, yeah, that partnership with the Water Patrol is a, is a, is a special one. 
Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of folks don't know uh, how this functions, but basically anywhere there's water in Hennepin County, and you think about the two biggest uh, bodies being the Mississippi River and uh, Lake Minnetonka, um, there's usually a Hennepin County uh, patrol out there, uh, especially out here on Lake Minnetonka, but as you say, uh, Mayor Walsh, uh, there's an incident somewhere they can uh, get called or deployed. Also swimming pools, uh, interestingly enough, that counts as water related. That, that counts as water in Hennepin County, so uh, any other uh, questions, comments? Any, any thoughts from the council here? Um, a couple questions. First of all, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks, um, council member. I was, uh, you know, you hear the term uh, affordable housing used a lot. Um, and I think there's a misconception of what it means. You know, what, can you help explain what the definition of affordable housing is as you're using it in your statistics there? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the, the, the starting point would just be to say that regardless of a resident's income level, higher income to very low income adding below the poverty line. Um, typically we consider somebody spending more than a third of their income as housing cost burdened. Uh, so by extension, you want a wide array, a wide array of uh, housing options that are affordable to people at every level uh, at a third of their income. So then how we structure that in terms of that housing continuum I, I showed you is we sort of have it in tiers around uh, area median income or AMI. Uh, so when you talk about workforce housing, you're usually talking about housing at the, the 60 to 30, uh, 60 to 80 percent AMI, and that would be that somebody who's at 60 to 80 percent of the area median income would be able to afford to live here and not be paying more than a third of their income on their rent or their mortgage. And as you move down, um, you know we stand, we have a 10-year um, strategy to build a thousand new units of deeply affordable and supportive housing. This is housing that has to be affordable to a household at a 30% AMI and below. Oftentimes those are residents uh, that are navigating uh, you know, uh, some pretty significant uh, life upheaval situations and we like to provide services for them as well to help get them back on their feet. These are the units that we stand up that are designed to directly facilitate exits from homelessness so folks can stay in that housing for as long as they need as they uh, move back up from these safety nets into what I like to call opportunity ladders So when you use the, your numbers there, that was kind of taken, when you said Hennepin County, it's taking, you break it down by a region? Uh, well, and, I mean, there's, you could slice it however you want. For the purposes of this presentation, I sliced it uh, based on Minnesota's largest county, which is how we look at it, because that's how we're, we're making these interventions. But. Yeah, all right, thanks for that. Yeah. And then um, I sit on the police commission, was on it, um, you know, so I got to hear firsthand um, with the embedded social worker um, when it was a pilot program, and could you just speak to what kind of funding is available and how long uh, is that extended, and then what contribution is kind of expected out of each? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to shed a little bit more light on that. It's uh, you know emphasis on the word partnership there because it really is a partnership. Um, starting with the, the funding, um, it's a 60-40 uh, split between the county and uh, local uh, law enforcement. I think in the case out here, there's a, uh, there's a sort of a coalition or an alliance of a few different uh, lane area police, yeah. police departments. Yeah. That it's five, five to you. Yep, and the, five five five. yep, and the social worker is, uh, I think, technically office at the South Lake uh, Department, but provides services around, around the lake. Um, but it really, I mean, it embeds the, the way the the workforce side of it works is it's a Hennepin County social worker. They're on our payroll. Um, that's important um, for workforce reasons, but also for data practices re regions. You know, um, there's a lot of challenges uh, for privacy re uh, reasons sharing, uh, you know, a, a residents' data between different jurisdictions. But when you've got a Hennepin County social worker that's entitled entitled to the human services data, sometimes entitled to some of the um, criminal justice data, if there's, there's some of those things happening, um, it, it allows for much more of a seamless uh, handoff. So what we've, what we've seen in a lot of jurisdictions where, where this uh, has been now operating for a few years is as much as an 80% reduction in repeat calls to 911 among those residents that are, might be considered the frequent flyers. So, uh, not to pick on anyone if there's a Mr. Anderson in the room, but you know, when Mr. Anderson is now called um, 911 for the 10th time this week, and that requires a police response, Mr. Anderson probably needs something more than a, you know, an, 
an, an officer showing up to provide assistance. What that really is, it's a call for help and a need for other types of resources. So. Well, it's a good program. I know the perspective and our department appreciates having it there. Thank you. How does the social worker ascertain if the scene is safe? Well, so in, in, in this particular model, it is not an alternative response. So we're not sending, you know, if 911 is called, we're not sending a social worker out as an alternative to a police response. It's also, I mean, you're starting to see a little bit of a hybrid emerge with some of these partnerships where the partnership between the social worker and the police department is really strong. Um, but it's also not generally a co-response, right, where you'd have a police officer go and then you'd also have the social worker go, although that happens on, on occasion if the officers have made a determination that it's safe. What it's mostly is a follow-up. It's, oh my goodness, there's a situation here with a resident and we really need to get them connected to a different type of service. I responded to a call in Edina uh, where there was a, a, a woman that had fallen in her apartment, broken her hip, she was a senior citizen. Uh, but when we got to the apartment, it was also just a mess. There was, it hadn't been cleaned probably in years. There was no food in the cupboard or the pantries um, or, or the refrigerator. And it was, and she had never been connected to services before. And she was gonna go to the emergency room. Um, there was a universe where her apartment could have gotten sort of public health involved and gotten seized and then she would have been homeless. Uh, instead, we were able to connect her with a social worker who was able to get her connected to rent assistance dollars and you know connected to the federal benefits that she might be entitled to around uh, food assistance. So you turn a situation around for a resident and hopefully that resident's not calling, you know, police 10 times a week. Thank you. Yeah. I had a follow-up question on that subject. Do you find that the other communities that this social worker is shared with are finding that they could use more, or is this? Yes, okay. <laughs> there's okay. been a great demand for these okay. services as evidenced by its growth. And I think that's one of the things, um, you know, I'm specifically interested in, you know, Hennepin County, we're able to get a, we're able to scale this because uh, we're actually able to rely on um, Medicaid reimbursement uh, based on caseload uh, to pay for our portion of it. So I'm in conversation with Congressman Phillips and, and, and other federal partners to try to see it, would, would there be a way for us to figure out um, as this grows, because you know Hennepin's not the only jurisdiction in the country doing things like this, how we might provide a little bit more assistance to cities to help make sure that this scales um, even further, you know, gen generally when I'm out in Washington or in uh, St. Paul advocating for, for dollars or a policy shift, I'm advocating for Hennepin dollars. This is one of those areas where I'm like, well, if we're going to grow this partnership, we really need to uh, grow the pie for everyone. Thank you. All right, well, thanks for coming. We appreciate yeah. it. Look forward to seeing you in 12 months. Yep. <laughs> Not before. Okay. Not before, exactly. Thanks. All right, next on our... Uh, Items is the fire department report, uh, which is number seven. It uh, really isn't an author. It really isn't an authorization. It's probably the wrong word. It's really more of an update on our development specs and obtaining quotes for the rescue pump, fresh medical response utility, and tender taker. Chief Allen. Absolutely, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Yes, uh, the purpose of this action item is to inform council uh, on staff's plans for procurement of the process of fire equipment necessary to provide services to the Navarre service area. Uh, the Orono needs assessment uh, was accepted on the June 12th council meeting. In that needs assessment, staff recommended that the city of Orono front up rescue pump for a brush medical slash utility response and a tanker or tender at each fire station. On the June 12th meeting, council directed the new department to be ready to provide service to the Navarre area in July of 24 and the rest of the city um, by the end of the contract. So the table below kind of describes that plan. Uh, so first, the rescue pumper. Step one would be to try and coordinate access to Engine 21 with Long Lake. Uh, the engine was purchased solely by the City of Orono in 2003 to serve the Navarre area. Uh, once a replacement is procured, it can be used as a backup pumper, which would be good to do. Step two would be to solicit proposals for a new or slightly used uh, rescue pumper. The lead time on new apparatuses have been ranging anywhere from 24 to 36 months. Uh, and then upwards of cost of you know, between 500000 and a million dollars. The Fresh Medical Response Utility uh, will solicit new proposals for that vehicle. Uh, based on the vehicle uh, use, uh, staff does not recommend a used vehicle for this role. This rolls on all of our medicals, 
uh, many of our calls. As we did a study on when I was with Long Lake, um, that particular piece of apparatus sold the most as any of the apparatus out there. The tanker tender, step one, would try and be coordinated a buyout of one or two of the existing tankers, one of the two existing tankers from Long Lake. Step two, if, if we're unsuccessful with that, would be to solicit proposals for a new or slightly used uh, tender truck or tanker truck. Um, the funding for these would be coming from the Fire Equipment Fund. Um, some of the new equipment, there is a possibility that we could purchase those in a five year payment plan uh, to try and um, kind of level out those payments rather than getting hit with a million dollars this year and nothing the next and the next stuff. So uh, I recommend the staff engage the City of Long Lakes uh, staff for the purchase of one of the two tenders we currently joint own with Padina and Long Lake, as well as a disposition for Engine 21. Uh, I will work concurrently uh, with vendors to develop the cost effective specification. Quotes for a rescue pumper, brush medical truck, and tanker and tender. Once those quotes are received, uh, we'll bring them back to council and present them to council for those large amount. Awesome. Well, thanks for that update. Any questions for the chief while we're here? Yeah, I do have some questions. Um, first of all, well, your step one on both rescue pumper and um, tanker tender involved coordination with Long Lake. As you're going to try that first, in other words? Correct, yes. Um, at the last fire advisory board meeting, they did talk about Engine 21 being retired early next year uh, because they had obtained uh, the purchase of uh, Excelsior's used engine that uh, should be coming available to them. So hopefully that works out. Um, and then the tank contender will have to sit down and try and have conversations and myself with them on that. I'm just considering the reality of that given the current situation with litigation pending. Is that really an option? You're going to try. That would be, yeah, absolutely. We're going to try. <clears throat> okay, so I had a question on the rescue pumper. I understand we have one at station two. Um, the pumping capacity has been disabled. Can that be repaired? Is there a reason this vehicle can't be repaired? I have no idea what you're talking about. That sounds like a problem for Long Lake and Long Lake Fire. And, uh, if, if we have a downed engine, that's, that's the first news I've ever heard. Um, why do you believe it's uh, down? I'm sorry? Uh, why do you believe it's, it's uh, down? That's what I understand in talking to folks. So if it's not, I'm just wondering um, if a truck like that couldn't be repaired. What, what case are you specifically speaking about? Rescue pumper. What number? Station two. I don't know the numbers, but I think there's only one there. I guess I, I don't know what's wrong with it, so I can't answer the question if it can be repaired or not. Okay. So I'm sorry. So you're looking to purchase um, <clears throat> either used or new equipment. And how soon would you be coming back to council for these? Uh, it depends on how fast we can obtain the quotes and develop the specs with the, the vendors. So we've been working on developing the specs for the last couple of months here. Um, we're waiting on some quotes back. Yeah, I'd love to talk out loud and find out what problems they're having with that piece of apparatus and figure out which one it is. If they've got a down engine, that's that's a major problem. No, I don't think, I think it's something that perhaps isn't being utilized at this time. I'm just trying to get a handle on um, the idea of um, buying new equipment, which is very expensive. So. Anyway, we can talk about that. Absolutely, expensive equipment the last you know twenty to twenty five years. Yeah, no, I understand, and I know I know that brush medicals are very important. Um, Long Lake purchased a new one recently. Was that a capital expenditure that was talked about recently with Long Lake in our contract of <coughs> providing assistance with that purchase? Uh, it was discussed uh, last year, yes, and then um, when we came back, it was determined that we needed to jump on the two tunnels first, and so that's what we did, and then I never brought it back because that was, it was the end of the year, and I was, you know, hired to get back, so. How many times in the past was a brush medical discussed with Long Lake? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, no. I don't know. 
supporting a new one, I mean, because I know it's old. Excuse me, what? Supporting the purchase of a new one, because I know this one is old. Mm -hmm. Correct. You don't know how many times we talked about supporting that capital expenditure in the past. I know, it's not. Sorry. Okay. Um, yes. Thanks. Any other questions for the chief? All right, thanks, Chief. We appreciate yeah, it. We'll thank you. See thank you. Uh, the next council meeting is yep. very full. All right, uh, that will bring us to our uh, finance report. Thank you, thank you Mayor. Uh, the only update I have is more on technology. I just want to update you on tomorrow morning. Security and sound will be here, and among other things, we'll be running some cabling. Oh, new stuff in here? Yes, that'll probably not happen until the, towards the end of September. Oh, okay. There's a back order on the delay on the company that is installing that. I don't know if it's the equipment or their schedule, but it'll be September. But it's a delay with the back order, so okay. Yeah. Okay, any other questions for finance? Yeah. All right, thanks, Ron. Thank uh, you. City Attorney Report, Soren. Uh, Mr. Mayor, member of the council, I do have an item, but it's under the closed session, so I'll wait till that time. Do we have anybody from community development here that stayed around that has any update, or Josh, you got any update on parks? Since I got you here? I did quick one. Sure. <clears throat> Get you some face time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, park staff, they're, uh, they're staying busy this year. We just uh, finished cutting down the rest of the trees over at Hackberry Park after the demo of the house. Uh, so that park is really starting to open up. Adam and I will be meeting with our subcommittee, our park commission subcommittee for Hackberry this Wednesday, discussing the master plan. So looking forward to providing some updates in the future. Um, <clears throat> golf course is, it's busy. Uh, so today was our very first food truck event at the golf course. I know how that go. Uh, that was, that went really well. Uh, so we had a lot of staff show up around, around lunchtime and then uh, we had two different leagues tonight that are taking advantage of it. So uh, excited to see that happening and hopefully it goes well and we'll see it back. Uh, we're planning maybe every other week, depending on how it goes. I would think that that would go well. Yeah. You know? yeah. And I didn't notice Hackberry looks really different without the, the fence and the house and the, the, it's all graded so it's all kind of the dirt's been put back in and it looks, yeah. looks great. So now it's moving forward. Uh, we can revitalize that park for the first time ever. Yeah, we're excited. So, uh, yeah, the staff, they're, they're doing a great job, though. We, we've got a great team this year, uh, both in the parks and at the golf course. So, really happy with where we're at. Awesome. Any questions for, for Josh? Yeah. All right, thanks. All right, well, that will bring us to our city administrator engineer report. And we have our next work session draft. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, on the uh, draft uh, next work session, uh, I, I had a recommendation to cancel it um, because we did not have an item uh, for the next meeting. However, um, our uh, cannabis uh, discussions today uh, will cut a little bit short. Um, so if the, if the attorney can be ready and you would like them, I would change my recommendation to uh, adding that um, to the agenda for the work session. Um, I think we can get you the next one somewhere. Is that uh, July? Yeah, yeah, that works. Do we need an hour, or do you think we can do it in half an hour, or? Um, Probably an hour would be safe. I, I think an hour for the cannabis. Yeah. Okay, well, it's just so that everybody will get it from the cannabis discussion in general on there for the next work session. Okay, do we need a motion to add that? To yeah. yeah. I'll make a motion to add that the cannabis uh, can remove the THC pegging. Sure, yeah, we can change the title. So <laughs> Cannabis discussion on um, for July 10 uh, work session starting at 5 o'clock. Second one. Okay, one favor say aye. 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 We know that passes 5 0.
Any other update from uh, City Administrator? Uh, just a couple engineering updates. Um, <coughs> one, the public, new public works facility is uh, proceeding. Uh, you may notice the very large crane um, that is uh, finishing in putting the wall panels in. Um, right after the holiday, uh, the next major uh, item will uh, start there, which is uh, putting in the, the roofing joists um, as they continue to work to uh, seal that building uh, in. So uh, that is uh, currently progressing on schedule. Uh, we have had our um, uh, pre-construction conference for the um, parking lots, which is the Navarre Community Parking Lot and the Golf Course Upper Parking Lot. Um, both of the, the, the Navarre parking lot uh, due to start uh, in mid-July, uh, and then the Golf Course uh, parking lot will be a couple days or uh, in September, uh, late August, early September. How are the other orders coming together with the Navarre parking lot? Uh, we've reached out to everybody uh, by mail. Uh, we have, uh, I've had uh, several phone calls with the, uh, the owner manager of the Narrows. Um, so they're looking at doing some paving at the same time. So we'll be coordinating that. They're going to contract directly with the uh, same contractor that we have. And so um, that will hopefully make things smoother there. Hopefully they'll all do it too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is the Orno golf course lot going to be straight? It will be, yes. <laughs> That'd be a new one. Yeah, yes, yes. That, that has been a point of contention. Some of there's uh, advocates who wanted to stay unstriped, and then there's a group who wanted striped. But we're going to try. It. We're going to try as uh, we uh, <coughs> the whole thing to get it striped and see if we can bring a little bit of order to the chaos that sometimes is that parking lot. <laughs> um, the uh, let's see. The other update I had oh, is the the cured in place pipeline project, uh, which every year. Uh, New members, you know, every year we spend about a quarter of a million dollars trying to uh, fit our sewer lines uh, by doing uh, linings inside of our old clay pipes. Um, so that project uh, is due to start uh, actually we start uh, flushing it uh, this week, um, and then be doing the actual lining in early July. Um, all those pipes for this year are down on the Casco Point uh, in that area, and that should uh, when we're done with that, that should have retrofitted all all the main sewer pipes. So a lot of things are starting to, to, to take off. The only uh, thing that I don't have good dates on yet um, is our road projects. Um, so still waiting to uh, get the pre-construction conference done for Fox Street. Um, and then I know Medina, who's leading our town line road project, is getting ready. We're going to have an open house in a few weeks, but uh, don't have exact timings from them yet either. So those are kind of the main events. All right. Any other questions for Adam? All right. Thanks. Thank you. Right, that will bring us to our public comments section, which is limited to three minutes per person. We do make a minor change on here, which I'll get to. It's an opportunity for the public to address the council. Uh, the council will not engage in discussion or take action on items presented at this time. However, the council may refer issues to staff or follow up for consideration at a future meeting. The speakers should state their name and home address at the podium before speaking. The council will first open the podium for City of Orono residents, so if you can raise your hand, I'll call on you. Come up uh, once we are done and the Orno residents have been completed their talking, then uh, we will open it up to uh, the members of the public who address address the council. And if they could raise their hand, we'll call them up as well. So, uh, Adam is our gatekeeper for the uh, time. He keeps puts it right up there on the uh, thing, so you can kind of watch it right up there. Um, so, if any Orno residents, yes, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Kat Sutman. I live at 475 Deborah Drive. And I'm speaking again this evening to protest what I've seen in terms of the, the process and the conduct that takes place at these meetings. I've seen abuse of power, and uh, there are many examples. I'm only going to touch on a couple. February, first meeting I attended, I saw the mayor engage in uninterrupted 15 minute rant berating another council member. For months, our pleas from numerous citizens for a meeting with wholesome discussion to consider all aspects of fire services have been ignored. The meeting of 522 was not adequate. Other member matters have been similarly dismissed. So there was an argument last, set, last two weeks ago. The mayor was elected, let him do his job. And of course, I agree, the mayor was elected. But I disagree that he's doing his job. Here's my take, just my view. This mayor is gaslighting us. He manipulates us using counter narratives. There are made up stories popping up here and there, denial of facts, 
discrediting and silencing people who don't agree. And we had some of that yet again this evening. An open discussion survey is not of interest because our opinions don't matter. The goal of the gaslighter is to obtain power and control by others, over others by creating chaos, conflict, and confusion. So I want to say something to the firefighters and their families. And thank you for having sacrificed so much to keep us safe in our communities. And there isn't any way I can thank you for giving up what you've given up. And I know it's not just the firefighters, it's the families as well. My husband and I have lived here since 1985. I, we have never heard any complaints about response times or quality of service. And we've had many episodes where we've directly dealt with the firefighters and they've done a great job. To the angry folks who are here, week after week, placing a loud exclamation point at the end of each meeting, I don't disbelieve that you have issues and grievance with the council. However, I plead with you, yelling, obscene language, and personal attacks will not solve your problems, and it will not garner empathy from your fellow citizens. It, in fact, makes some of the council members' behavior look better by comparison. So if you need to raise a concern, please do, but name the issue, avoid name-calling, yelling, and obscene language. To the citizens of Oriel, I ask you to pay attention to what is happening here. Restoring a healthy democracy in our small city requires all of us citizens with a wide diversity of opinions and perspectives to problem solve together, to listen to each other, and reclaim our shared power. Democracy is not a spectator court, sport, and there's an election next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know where I was in. Yes, ma'am, right in front here. Kim Carswell, 261 Signa Place. My comments are a response to the last council meeting on June 12th. By suppressing council member discussion, the Orono City Council is not following best practices for fair and impartial decision making. It is important for Orono citizens to hear all the council members' viewpoints, so shutting down the Lisa Benson's discussion at our last meeting was an insult to the Orono majority that elected her in 2022. She represents the most recent voters' choice, and those voters deserve to hear her point of view. This type of behavior that occurred is a new low from my experience with the Orono City government because the meetings are being run like there's an autocracy here. Let me read a few points from the mayor's uh, Minnesota Mayor's Handbook. Presiding officers should not dominate discussion. In most cities, the mayor participates equally in council meetings. Generally, the mayor has the same right as any other council member to discuss issues, make second motions, and vote. Since the mayor is also the presiding officer at meetings, this can create a difficult situation on issues where the mayor may have strong views. In recognition for this dual role as participant and meeting facilitator, Mayors may choose to limit their comments or save their comments until all other members have had a chance to voice their views. Presiding officers should also allow participants to speak and present their views. The role of the presiding officer is to facilitate the discussion. Mayors should not use this authority to silence political opponents or suppress views which, with which the mayor does not agree. Also, I would say to the council, if the mayor is not going to have decorum, it's up to you to step in and show the citizens you care about conducting a respectful meeting and bringing all voices back to Orono. This ongoing suppression of the citizens and now the suppression, suppression, suppression of a popularly, popularly elected council member has gone too far. In closing, the council is following legal procedures, but is not following the best practices for a healthy, respected, and vibrant council. Alisa won the most votes in the last election. This is her base of support. It is not just the people like me and others that show up at the meetings. Watching her being suppressed by the current mayor and other council members is not sustainable or a winning strategy for Orono, its citizens or the council. Next year is an election year and three of our council members are up at the end of their terms, Mr. Walsh, Mr. Crosby, and Ms. Beach. Let us elect collaborative and respectful citizens when we enter that voting booth. Thank you. And I have a copy to put in minutes. Thanks. Penny Saiki, 
2874 Glasgow Point Road. And my question is, I um, this last uh, lawsuit, I understand that's number six for the year, is that right? For, or no, since last August, or July or August. I would have to double check that, I'm not sure. Are you the defense every time we're sued? No. So we hire other firms? They're covered by insurance. Or no insurance? No. Okay, so how many suits do we budget a year? Well, I mean, there's got to be a fund that pays for well, the insurance. And I would imagine that's going up because we keep getting sued. Um, and now we're being sued by another city for services about a fire contract that wasn't discussed. So I think there's got to be some liability here with the council, too, because when you, when you take your pledge, you're taking an oath as a person, but you're not taking, when you step on the council, you're still a person, you're still an individual acting for the city. And whether or not you're in my speech, but um, acting for the citizens doesn't take away liability for your actions. And so I hope that you realize that when we get our new fire department, if things don't go just like crackers, like it goes right now, and if the response times are less, and something happens where someone is hurt or killed, I think you need to realize that your actions now are not just for Orono, they're as individuals. You, you, just because you sit on the council doesn't take away your liability and your responsibility as a person when you take that oath. Just a reminder, okay? All right, is there anybody else from Orono tonight that would like to speak? Seeing none, I'll open up the general public. Is there anybody else from the general public who would like to speak tonight? Right in the back. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Kelly Grady. I'm a Long Lake resident. I am also a fire wife. Um, I live at 271 Green Hill Lane. Um, I just wanted to come up and I'm going to continue to address council as I can throughout um, the ongoing fire negotiations, I guess it's not really a word anymore, but um, problem solving um, that our two cities are, are engaged in. Um, and I was disappointed at the last council meeting to learn that the Long Lake Firefighters submitted a letter to the council and was not allowed to read that to um, in front of the public. So I have an excerpt here. Um, from them. It says, because of the recently accepted plans by the city of Moreno to prematurely annex Station 2 and its call area, which goes directly against our request, our request being the Long Lake Volunteer Firefighter Relief Association, we feel it is important to repeat our strongly encouraged recommendation to keep to both cities to keep this department whole. It simply does not benefit our community to dismantle this operationally successful fire department and, and in turn to create two super, superfluous departments with uncertain futures. Members of the Long Lake Fire Department are, are citizens of our collective community who serve our collective community and want the opportunity to continue to do so as one department for decades to come. Um, it's been my personal stance that I'm not the person who should be deciding what course of action should happen, but to question how we come to those decisions um, and to challenge the cities to stay together because I know, and you all know, that it has been a very successful department. Um, and because of that, I'd like to ask each council, and I will at both meetings, um, ask each of them, what steps are you taking to keep this crew together as per their request? What are you doing to ensure those that want to continue to serve can do so in a similar capacity? What are you doing to allow each firefighter to maintain their years of service and the benefits that they have earned in service to this community? Are you going to ensure that their pensions are made whole? And will their training and certifications be maintained? Lastly, as part of their statement, they said, as, a as part of the Long Lake Firefighters Relief Association, 
statement. Their final request was, as a demonstration of your stated support of the dedicated and proud firefighters who serve your community, we ask that you do everything in your power to find a mutually beneficial path forward for shared fire services. And I just would really like for the firefighters to be heard because as I've heard many people refer to and people on this council, including Councilwoman Veach, this is an ugly divorce and it's affecting our crew in, in negative ways and they continue to serve us bravely and heroically and I appreciate them for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else from the general public? Brad Erickson, 2485 Independence Road. I spoke with Mr. Maddock last week about, <clears throat> well, first I'll apologize for my part in the mayhem last week. I figured that you guys being such um, defenders of the Constitution would be more about, um, you know, the First Amendment than, than you've proven to be. Um, but in any case, I spoke with Mr. Maddock after the meeting, and, and there is no requirement to live in this city to speak in this city. I'll also add that I had millions of dollars in investment in this city, and I was paying hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in taxes in this city when this issue came about. So I don't know what city you would want me to go complain to, but my issues are with you and, and with you now. So that's why I'm here. So maybe we could clear that up. Um, Debbie the Divider. You were dividing us during the pandemic. You were dividing us during George Floyd. You divide us during the election cycles. And you divide us with Long Lake. And now you're trying to divide up Long Lake. Quite a legacy. That was my issue all along. What were you doing? I knew the second I saw that video that you sent me what you were up to, and I knew there was more. I had no idea it would lead to the Capitol steps on January 6th with Mr. Crosby. I had no idea it would lead to the, don't shake your head no, because guess what? My lawsuit is finished. It will be number seven this year for pending Psyche. It is number six currently, and number seven will be filed maybe tomorrow. And you will need to answer all those questions. All the stuff that you say are lies are in the lawsuit. And it includes you now, Mr. Uh, Crosby II. So um, hopefully you've got your answers ready. You've had over a year to prepare them. Remember, I offered you guys a chance and you didn't take it, right? And I warned you guys that this is what we would do. And here I am a year later. You think I'm going away? I'm not going away. So you guys decide how you want to handle it. I would have taken Ms. Benson's uh, advice with the, uh, with the um, League of Cities, the mediation, but that's just me. You know, I'd want to talk about this stuff behind closed doors, but if you want to do it publicly, that's great. It'll be on a permanent record as soon as this is served and filed. So, that'll be forthcoming. Thank you. Anybody else from the general public that would like to come up? Kelsey Wietrich, can you have my address? Uh, I would also like to apologize, if you think that's funny, you're a funny man, for my involvement in the mayhem, but had I not been interrupted, which you're not supposed to do, there wouldn't have been so much mayhem. So, Mr. Walsh, you like to tell people to stay offline and don't participate online. However, you're online. Why is that, I wonder? You're very bold online, too, but when you're in person, you're just a weak little man. You can't answer any questions. You won't do a mediation, because why? The answers are so obvious. You say, Clearly, they're not obvious because we're all wondering. The public is wondering. You don't like everything that's going on with the craziness of the meetings? Then deal with it. Man up and deal with it. Same with you, Mr. B. Grow up. Figure it out. Quit making problems for everybody. It's not about you. It's not about you. 
but you make it about yourself. Thank you. Does anybody else from the general public that would like to come up today? Seeing none, I will close the public comments and we'll go to the mayor counselor. Yeah. I think this young lady. Oh, oh sorry, did say any hands come up? Yeah, sorry. I live at 2570 Thoroughbred Lane, Lane and I'm an Orono resident. I've attended the last several meetings, especially um, regarding the fire issue that is, has been before you for quite a while. And my request is very simple. And I hope that it is acted upon by the council and by the staff, because that is one of the things that you offer up because you will not respond to public comment during these meetings, which I completely understand. But I would like the requests that all of us have made over the last several meetings for a clearly articulated reason why an Orono Fire Department must exist. I have not received any clear indication of that I do know that my taxes will be going up at least 20% in the next year. And I would like some sort of accounting for that. So if you would please take my request, come up with some clearly articulated reason why this is required. We're, we have very intelligent voter base here in Orono. Logic appeals. We would like clear understanding of what it is that requires us to set up a separate fire department where you actually compare apples to apples, response time to response time, not no fight, you know, no lights response time to a lights re response time. I just want some clear indication. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from more or the general public? Okay, seeing none, I will close that and bring it to our New York Council report. And with Council Member Beach being your first meeting, I'll let you start. Anything you'd like to give update on? Or? I have no update. I just wanted to introduce myself, though, and if that's all right. Absolutely. I'm Maria, longtime resident.
I'm going to discuss several documents I've created that may help demonstrate why we as a council continue to grapple with issues of trust. Before I do, I want to mention that we are operating at a disadvantage when we discuss issues without an agreement on fundamental facts. For instance, according to my watch right now, it's 7.06 p.m. You may have a different time on your watch or phone, but it's likely off by just a minute or two. Most likely, no one in Orno would look at the time now and see that it's mid-morning. If they did, they probably have a broken clock. It's important that when we discuss major issues, we talk about facts that we agree upon. If we're not able to do that, we approach challenges in ways that make them much more difficult to get our arms around. My documents are based in fact. Everything in the documents I created was pulled from verifiable city records. These are not opinions, they are data. Rather than have staff project them on the screen, hard copies will be available at the end of the meeting. At the previous meeting, the mayor did not want this information shown. While I disagree with that decision, I will abide by it. These documents will also be part of the record as I have given copies to Adam Edwards, our city administrator. The first document relates to fire services. It's a simple timeline that covers the last five years of events related to the formation of an Orno Fire Department. The timeline highlights major decisions related to our city's progression away from contracting fire service with the Long Lake Fire Department. The timeline highlights the lack of effort to inform and collaborate with citizens from the beginning of the process. It lists the publication date of every city newsletter and utility bill insert from the last few years. One mention of the Orno Fire Department was a few words in the January-February newsletter from this year. The brief communication came after many consequential decisions, including ending the contract with Long Lake, purchasing equipment, and hiring a fire chief had been made. How do we as elected officials expect our community to trust our decisions when we do not invite them to the table at the outset? If we are certain that the direction we're taking is one that will benefit our community, why do we hesitate to broadcast it? Unfortunately, community engagement related to the formation of the Ornell Fire Department came years after the decision to end our contract with Long Lake was made. This decision was made without input from citizens. Engagement came at the very end of the process and involved one public hearing and the invitation to write comments to the city. I'm going to address the comment cards because many Orno residents took time to share their thoughts, concerns, and questions on those cards. This council has not discussed them. The comment cards were attached to the council packets for the May 22nd and June 12th meetings this year. They were not tabulated, and the public was given no opportunity to see results in an accessible format. If we as a council are going to solicit public feedback, then we have an obligation not only to share it in a digestible way, but to utilize it. We've done neither. The second document I've created is a spreadsheet that organizes data from the common cards. The spreadsheet distinguishes residents from non-residents and indicates the number of residents who support the formation of an Orno Fire Department, as well as those who do not or who question the necessity. A third category shows residents who wanted more information question the process, or who requested that Orno and Long Lake work out a mutually agreeable solution. The numbers show that the residents of Orno overwhelmingly oppose the formation of an independent fire department, with 60% opposing and 26% in favor. 11% are the third category I mentioned a moment ago who are either underinformed or unhappy with the process. The data collected from our staff through our own process does not support the direction that we as a city are taking. Another way of putting it is, we have been spending money and discussed spending significantly more tonight to do the opposite of what our residents want. This is significant and it is troubling. 
It is also troubling that this project undertaken by our city council has resulted in new legal action being taken against the city of Warnham. On Friday, the city of Long Lake filed a suit with Hennepin County asking a judge for an injunction to stop further actions related to fire service by the city of Warnham. We are heading in a direction unfavorable with residents that will cost more, goes against nationwide trends, and may result in costly litigation. My final document details the progression of committee work on this council over the course of time. Committees are a place where staff and members of council meet to discuss city business. They are not subject to open meeting law because a quorum of council is not present. Part of the memo regarding the budget discussion tonight mentioned the fact that this is the second year that budget discussions have been taken into committee. In other words, two members of council are able to influence and shape the direction outside of public meetings and without the input of other council members. The data included in my spreadsheet is taken entirely from public record and includes the last decade as this was available on the owner website. The data shows several trends with committee work on this council over time. Number one, committee assignments have been moved from the month of January to December. This means that newly elected members of council are not part of the process. Assignments are discussed and set before newly seated members have an opportunity to weigh in. Number two, the committee assignments also moved from a regular agenda item to the consent agenda. Consent agenda items are not discussed and can be passed in one vote. Number three, the number of committees has increased over time. Among others, we currently have committees for budget, code review, fire negotiating, parks, and the newly formed legal committee that was created last month. The legal committee was created at the end of a regular council meeting. It was not on the regular agenda and was not recommended by staff. It states, its stated purpose is for two members of council to meet with the city attorney privately apart from council to discuss legal strategy. Number four, the final point of note is that the mayor sits on every committee related to fire services, code review, budget, communications, parks, and legal. This is a lot of information to digest. The intention is to lend increased transparency to the workings of this council to demonstrate how seriously I take the trust that has been placed in me as one of its members. Some may be of the opinion that elected officials were elected for a reason, and we as citizens need to let them do their job. To this I ask, what expectations do we have for our healthcare providers, educators, financial advisors, or home improvement professionals? Would we allow our healthcare or financial matters to be managed by others with no expectation that we be kept in the loop about major decisions. City government is no different. Residents have the right to hold elected officials to the same high standard expected of others whom they entrust with their most valued assets. I have one final item. I thank each candidate who interviewed for the open council seat. The time and effort put into the process was significant and I enjoyed meeting each of the candidates and learning about how they would contribute to our city. That's all I have, thank you.
in a, in a different way. And, and, and the public has to, has to be clear, because it wasn't, I, I didn't get this from, from the statements, is that committees don't make decisions. Committees make recommendations. And so, you know, the meeting laws, you know, you only can have two council members together, otherwise it has to be publicized and it has to be a meeting, so you have committees. And the purposes of committees uh, is to uh, make recommendations. And so those recommendations come to the council to get voted on whatever transparency uh, someone's afraid is missing from those can be brought up in the item itself. So we make a recommendation, it goes to the city council, the city council puts it on an agenda. Um, yes, it can go on a consent agenda, but I wouldn't want to mislead you and let you think that things on the consent agenda aren't reviewed. It's a responsibility of every city council member prior to the meeting to review consent agenda items. So we go, we read them, we do our research, we might talk to staff, we might watch the planning commission meeting, and if we can't get our questions answered, then we will pull it off the agenda. And this council, which I think is uh, really interesting that we do it, I know Long Lake doesn't do it, I was at their meeting, if something's on consent agenda, they invite the public to remove it. There's other municipalities that once they're on the consent agenda, those items, they don't invite anyone to remove them. At every meeting, we invite the public or a member of the city council to remove an agenda item. Therefore, we can discuss them in further detail. So that was another point that was brought up. I am in favor of removing the mayor uh, from some of the committees because he does have a full plate. And with uh, now council member uh, Beach on, I would like to make a motion to put her on with on the fire committee and the negotiation committee. Fire advisory. Fire advisory. And um, and then uh, put her in that spot. I think my opinion on this is, and, and I've heard it, I think there's other, there's people uh, that want to see more communication with Long Lake, uh, particularly with respect to the fire department and how we move forward. Um, I can tell you that I personally um, have reached out to Long Lake to uh, initiate some additional conversations the, where I left it uh, on the negotiation committee was that after we made our decision, we would resume our uh, negotiation and conversations. Um, we did receive a lawsuit from them, so they're hesitant to engage us, at least that's the latest word from Long Lake, at least from their mayor. Um, I reached out uh, to the uh, other uh, negotiation member too. So I would like to continue to work forward because no matter what, if we're two separate departments or we find uh, a way to maintain the relationship, we have a lot to discuss. Keeping in mind, we own 85% of that equipment. And we, some of the uh, equipment, including um, uh, at tw uh, on James Report, tw and Engine 21, we own 100%. So there's a lot of conversations that needed to happen. Can all be about negotiations, potentially not, but we have a lot to work through. Um, so we're gonna have in our motion there, staff is gonna reach out and, uh, <coughs> and discuss the vehicle piece, but uh, we've also given staff permission to engage their city's uh, staff over there and see what uh, solutions they can come up. So I, went on beyond my uh, my motion, but I, I did make a motion to to uh, if if you I'll second that. Second that. Second that. Could I ask just a clarification on your motion? You mentioned uh, adding Councilmember Beach to the Fire Negotiating Committee and the Fire Advisory Board. Um, each of those has two council members, so who? Well, Richard's on the one and Matt's on the other one. But and Danny, replacing, replacing me. Replacing the mayor. That, that was my question. Is that all right, Mr. Mayor? Yep. 
with you, so that was my motion. Second. I second. And there's some discussion. Well, I'd like to just point out that this is so the, it's an unfortunate habit that's become clear that this wasn't on the agenda, and now during mayor council we're making a motion. And I know, being briefed as we all were from staff, that this is not the ideal way to do city business is during mayor council to be making motions. Um, it's not preferred by staff, it's not agendized, and I don't think it's the right thing to do. And do you have any issue about the motion that's been made? My only issue is what I would say, and I didn't mention this earlier, that out of all the committees I talked about, I'm on none of them. One, um, one of the things so, you brought up was that you felt that Denny was on too many committees. So Matt brought up a solution to that. Sure. Right. And if you're bringing up a problem, you bring up a solution, that's why he made yeah. a motion. So this isn't something I was prepared to discuss at this moment because we're in the mayor council, which is about share outs. This is not a regular item. In my opinion, this would be better served to be a regular item and not at the end of the meeting because this is happening. Okay, we appreciate the opinion, but we do have a motion on the table. So you have Let an opinion on the motion on the table. My and, 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 uh, can, can the public stay quiet while we're talking at the council? I would appreciate that. I would appreciate that, yes. Got it, boss. So you're making a motion to appoint Councilmember Beach to both fire negotiating and um, fire advisory? Yes. I don't support it, no. Okay, well, all in favor say aye. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, I would oh, like sorry. some discussion. Oh, okay. That's okay. Um, one, I would like to know why. I guess, like last time, I, I tried <clears> to <throat> reach out, obviously, and you said you want to go publicly, so. Ew, yeah, and again, this is cute. Yeah. I would love to know now, I guess. No, it, it is good to know. Um, yeah. I don't know if you knew about this motion ahead of time before, or if you're being just as surprised by this as I am. I'm under the, I'm just learning everything here. And I'm okay. just learning the committees and by the committees that I've been appointed, I would um, agree I would, if I take on one, I, I don't know how this works, but I would certainly like to drop one um, if that works. Um, and I, I do think I have. So, so, what, yeah, so let's do with the one, I think you had a question for me, and so why she's not com comfortable with you on the fire advisor. I think, fire I, I do, th I know I, I reached out and I think you know because you were with Charlie, that I reached out to Charlie trying to meet him last week and um, reached out to John and John and Charlie both met me, or separately, um, but or agreed to meet and I ended up meeting just John. Um, but I do feel like with my history with um, some stuff that that is something that I think I could add a unique perspective to. Um, but I would, um, of the ones that I'm on, I guess I would like to then, if I did have to make a separate motion, and put this yeah, in we'll, discussion. Would, well, we have to finish the first motion, and then we need the second motion. I think it would be um, a fair and right thing to do. Like I said, I did mention this earlier, but I'm on none of these um, committees to at least appoint me to one of them being fire related. Well, that, that, that's, that, that's up to the decision of the council. I, I'm telling you why I don't support this motion as it stands. So it's not me specifically. It, it, I think it's not a fair um, balance. Sure, that's what I would like. But not me specifically, you have no concerns. Um, I think there's certainly the same thing that we that I talked to you about during the interview process, the potential or the optics of conflict with being um, a fire wife entering the negotiating. So that is something, but I think at, at the very least it would be um, very much appreciated to have a balance there with these two committees and allow another member of council who currently serves on none of these to serve on one related to fire. That's that's my instruction. Okay. Well, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, we'll have to pass this for you. Go figure. Can I make a motion yeah. to give up one? Yeah, well how about, uh, which one would you like to give up? Or you, you can make that motion at the next meeting or if you wanted to take more time. Oh, I thought the council decided. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go for time, sorry. Yeah. Okay, Council Member Johnson, do you have any further Mayor Council report stuff? No. The, there is some question out in, in the public. I'll just I'll raise it. She was, uh, Council Member Beach was just saying if I pick up two committees, I would like to. Relieve myself of one, and she doesn't have to do that at this second. She can. I'd like to add it, it to the agenda yeah. next time. If yeah. That's allowed. Okay. Yes, you can. There isn't any real confusion. It's just added her to, to these ones. She'd like to change her <coughs> load, and uh, that's all I have.
Council Member Crosby. Um, the woman who thanked uh, the fire department for their service. I appreciate that. Uh, it's a great kind of you. Um, serving the fire department for 10 years. Uh, I think there's a misunderstanding in the brush pumper rescue. Uh, I don't think uh, Councilman Pence had a full understanding of it. it it's, it's a rescue truck that can also uh, take care of brush fires, but its primarily purpose is metals. I think it's important to have somebody more intimate fire knowledge when you're on these committees regarding fire. It, it's extremely helpful. Uh, as far as the quorum is concerned, I think it's important for our residents to have the quorum in the audience, have respect for each other. Uh, it's important that we show respect for each other up here. Uh, it's not an easy job doing this and being attacked and being attacked personally. You know, there's lawsuits in this city, but when you look at them, there's been lawsuits going back 20 plus years from some people. We can't respond simply because we get a lawsuit. Because it'll never end. That's a problem. I had somebody last at the last meeting discuss what we really need to do as a city is go to Minneapolis and look at the study for trees with the Met Council. Well, the interesting thing is, this is Orono. We're not Long Lake. We work for the citizens of Orono. So it's up to this council to do what's best for the citizens of Orono. Because with the logic that's being presented, we should be turning over the police department to Lawn Lake and let them run that too. Because the budget, we pay 85 to 90% of the budget. That's why this is under discussion. And this isn't just a discussion that's been happening over months. We've been doing this for years. And the, the non-responsive side has been the city of Long Lake, not Warren. We gave them very good alternatives, very good options. They declined. Now, if we turn our back on our oath and decide to do what we think is in the best interest of the city of Long Lake, we're not here doing our jobs. The citizens of Orono are the people that voted us into office. Those are the people we're responsible for. And when people discuss the fire budget, ladies and gentlemen, we are the fire budget. These are the facts. I spent a lot of time in the department. I understand when the chief was presenting call percentages and so forth, all of that information. Somebody pointed out, what if somebody dies? Well, people have died. When it was Long Lake Fire. So to bring something of that nature up is in poor taste. Sir, that is not acceptable. Still victims die. Regardless of who's at the helm, victims unfortunately will die. I was with some of them. So to bring up people dying is not in very good taste. Absolutely. What I am saying is, your communication from our perspective to the citizens will improve. That needs to get better. Do I agree with you? 100%, yes. Our words need to get out to have citizens understand the approach, why we're doing it, the budget, and so forth. All of that is completely 100% correct. That needs to be improved. And I think this council will do that. We've always engaged people if they have questions and they have comments. If they handle themselves in a polite manner without cursing or cursing at other, other citizens of our city, we've handled them with respect and kindness. Even people that haven't. But unfortunately, 
when the public comments get out of hand and they've been very much in hand tonight, which is great, and that's mostly because there's a camera present. There's always a camera. So when that happens, things go smoothly. But it's a different story with the camera here tonight compared to last time. And yes, that was filmed. It just was not necessarily filmed by the news group. So I would say to everybody, yes, your expectation on more information, completely 100% warranted. <coughs> Absolutely. And we will be getting you that as soon as possible on a timely basis. I'm very okay with that. I think that's important to make sure everybody is understanding of our approach and where we're going with this. The knowledge of fire is extremely important. We hired a great fire chief to run this department. Do we still want to have open negotiations with the city of Long Lake? No. Absolutely. Do I want to erase the history of the department that I work for? No, I don't. I don't. Those people I consider as my family. So I think Matt's intention is not to do that, but a lot of those things rely on the other side. So what I'm saying is <coughs> people that have been coming to the citizens of Orange how many times have you gone to Long Lake to talk to them about their approach and coming to a middle ground with us? And I haven't seen, when you compare this to the police contract of years ago, when they walked away from Orono PD, there was zero upheaval. And you know something? Their quality of service went down, the response time went down, and their citizens aren't served enough. When they walked away from Orono PD, that was the ramification. There was zero outrage, zero. And we didn't sit there attack them. We didn't sit there as a council and write letters to their citizens trying to disparage them. We took it as a business decision. That's how we're taking this. Appreciate all the time and, and uh, people refraining. Have a great evening, ladies and gentlemen. All right, well, facts are a funny thing. Uh, some of this, and you can twist the facts to me into propaganda, and that's what's going on. When you talk about comment cards, you have 100 comment cards, and you try and say that 60% of Orno doesn't want us to do fire. You have 100 cards out of 8,000 people, and they're not even all residents. And I've had a whole bunch of residents tell me they're scared to even put a comment card in because there's people that might target them. You? Because they support exactly what we're doing. So facts have a funny thing. So a lot of half-truths, a lot of innuendo, and a lot of no-truths. So let's talk about a couple of facts. Let's look at this lawsuit. There's a, let's talk about the facts and innuendo. Let's talk about James. Did we take James? We didn't take James. We put out a knock to bids for who wanted to come and our fire chief, and we had great candidates. We had actually fabulous candidates, and we attract fabulous candidates because we have the budget to do everything, we do everything right, and in the end, James put his, uh, his name in the hat, we interviewed him, and he obviously had a leg up because he has all the information, we have a lot of respect for him. Even James said he knows the future of fire goes through our own. he wants to be part of it. So we didn't take James. What about the ladder truck? We didn't. Orno, Long Lake never wanted the ladder truck. They knew about the ladder truck. They didn't want it, so we bought it. It's only after the fact that they want to recreate history and say that we wanted it and they took it. It's absolutely not the truth. More innuendo, half truths, and no truths. How about hammering service? Well, let's look at Mountainous as an example, or uh, Minnetonka Beach as an example. You know, they had Mound doing their firework for, I don't know, how many decades? <laughs> if you take Mounds Fire, where their fire uh, and their, their fire station is, and go to the middle of Minnetonka Beach, it's a seven to nine minute drive time. You take Station One in Willow, it's a seven to nine minute drive time. It's the same. So by saying you don't have Station Two, even if Station Two didn't exist, it's the same time. Mound didn't leave because of response time. Or 
I'm saying Minnetonka Beach didn't leave Mom because of response time. They left because of money, because we did it for half the price. So the, the so hand-grained service is not an issue. Firefighters, they say we're, we're going to take their firefighters. You know what? We're not taking anybody again. We're putting out there saying who wants to come and apply. And even today, there's people out in Long Lake Fire who work for other fire departments. They can do that with us too. They can work at both. It's, we're not taking anybody. It's again, half truths, no truths, in innuendo. Pensions, that's a whole nother innuendo and no truth. The only reason we went to the legislature is to give the firefighters an opportunity to keep their pensions whole if, if they wanted to move them over. It was only for their benefit. Long Lake does not control or own the money. Orno does not control or own the money. The Fire Relief Association manages the money and it's the state's money. It has nothing to do with the cities. It's strictly giving them the opportunity to keep everything whole if they want to move over. It's for their benefit only. So saying that we're taking the pension from Long Lake is, again, a complete no truth. You know, probably the most reasonable person we've dealt with probably in the Long Lake City Council is John Dynick. He's been willing to talk. I know Maria met with him, had good dialogue before this lawsuit. And, and he was of the opinion too that you know it's we shouldn't just jump to lawyers we should have a conversation we can get to a point that we can make it work because we know the contract sending he's pretty reasonable but it's funny how that thing when they have those conversations at their own council meeting because there's been some leaks of the information that's been in their secret meetings their closed sessions where they're calling him a traitor in those meetings because he wants to have a discussion with us so that's the kind of stuff we have to work with is when somebody is calling their own council members traitors because they want to have conversations with us from a reasonable standpoint. I met with them on the fire advisory committee also before uh, we made our decision this last time and even told them, most likely we're going that direction, but we'd love to sit down with you right after, have whatever conversation you're getting. Our hand is always out. It's always out, regardless of how you treat us, regardless of how, what you've said in the newspaper about us. Uh, like the mayor said, that he doesn't trust us to do any services for Long Lake. That probably was not a helpful thing to put in the newspaper. But we're still there because we uphold our duty, not only for our own citizens, but then to the next wave of people out because we do police service for a number of cities, we do public works for a number of cities, and we're the backup on lots of different things for water and sewer all over the place. So we are out there all the time. If I was the Long Lakes president, there'd be a few things I'd be asking my council right now. I would wonder when they made a decision to hire a public relations company that has to put out their notices. Usually common sense tells me if you've got to hire a public relations company to put out your notices, you've probably got a bad, a bad message that isn't working very well. You've got to put lipstick on a pig. So where, where is that decision made? How much money are they spending on paying our agency? Does Long Lake residents know they bought the land next to the fire department for 200 some odd thousand? When was, but what other residents even know that? They're spending money like it's flying out the window. The legal cost to sue, did they talk about what the ramifications are of having to do the cost of a lawsuit and to what end? The contract's coming up either way. Have they talked about their budget and what their real budget is gonna be when they're by themselves or have to get somebody else to do their firework? Have they told the Long Lake residents that they've made a deal, a handshake deal with Loretto Fire? Do they tell anybody what that cost is? Who's making handshake deals in the dark? There's a lot of, if I was Long Lake, I'd be asking a lot of questions because all of our stuff is public. All the office we make, everything else. So with that, I'm going to end with a couple quotes. The first one is by Albert Einstein. The difference between stupidity and genius is that genius has its limits. The second one is by Muhammad Gandhi. It says, speak only if it improves the silence. So with that, I'm going to close the meeting, and we're going to go to closed session. This meeting will be closed as permitted by the attorney-client privilege, section 13D.05. Subdivision 3B to discuss litigation strategy regarding the City of Long Lake versus City of Orno. We'll take a five minute break as we need to clear the rooms since we're in closed session. Thank you.
you everybody for coming. Are you adjourning the meeting this time? Is there going to be another meeting after? Second on that? I'll second. Okay. Say aye. Aye. Now we've closed the meeting. We have not adjourned the meeting. We will adjourn the meeting after the closed session so there, is over. So there will be another meeting after the closed session? We have to reopen the meeting before we can adjourn. I see. It's a process that we have to do. And that's how you it's don't get to be in here during the closed session. That's how that works too. Is that how that works? It is. Thanks for pointing that out. You might want a PR firm. You might want to hire a PR firm there. Speaking of messaging, speaking of distasteful, are your dog